The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. While the people were listening, Jesus went on to tell a parable because he was near Jerusalem and they imagined that the kingdom of God was going to show itself then and there. Accordingly, he said, A man of noble birth went to a distant country to be appointed king and afterwards return. He summoned ten of his servants and gave them ten pounds. Do business with these, he told them, until I get back. But his compatriots detested him and sent a delegation to follow him with this message. We do not want this man to be our king. Now, on his return, having received his appointment as king, he sent for those servants to whom he had given the money to find out what profit each had made. The first came in and said, Sir, your one pound has brought in ten. Well done, my good servant, he replied. Since you have proved yourself faithful in a very small thing, you shall have the government of ten cities. Then the second came and said, Sir, your one pound has made five. To this one also he said, And you shall be in charge of five cities. Next came the other and said, Sir, here is your pound. I put it away safely in a piece of linen because I was afraid of you. For you are an exacting man. You pick up what you have not put down and reap what you have not sown. You wicked servant, he said. Out of your own mouth I condemn you. So you knew that I was an exacting man, picking up where I have not put down and reaping where I have not sown. Then... Why did you not put my money in the bank? On my return, I could have drawn it out with interest. And he said to those standing by, Take the pound from him and give it to the man who has ten pounds. And they said to him, But sir, he has ten pounds. I tell you, to everyone who has will be given more. But from the one who has not, even what they have will be taken away. But as for my servants, my enemies, who do not want me for their king, Bring them here and execute them in my presence. When he had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord Jesus Christ. Two very challenging readings for us today. Our first reading is taken from the second book of, of Maccabees. And the first thing is that it's not a sequel to the first book of Maccabees, written by two different authors, covering two different uh, periods. And the second book is, is a much uh, more compact. Uh, they're both about the protagonist, Judas Maccabeus, so they both um, share the, the name and, and you know, some period in common. But the first is a much broader period of history, covering about 40 years, from about 175 BC to about 135. The second book, covers a, a briefer period from about 180 through to 160. Uh, we have today this story that, that seems quite famous. It's, it's certainly it's a story that at least Jesus alludes to. So he, he knows uh, something of the details of this story of this brave and manly woman. Uh, the, the, the language is uh, problematic uh, for, for many of us at least, um, who very bravely instructs and, and cajoles her seven sons to, to remain faithful to the, uh, all of the Torah and the teachings of the, the dietary requirements and, and so forth that um, the Jewish law had essentially um, pro provided within uh, the Torah. And she, this is so um, Antiochus um, Epiphanes or Epiphanes the fourth we know from history, is a Greek ruler, absolutely evil, and, and you know, well deserves the, the title of being a tyrant. So he's there speaking Greek and, if, and wanting the people to speak Greek, but she um, speaks to them in the ancestral tongue, so in, in Hebrew. She's addressing the community, addressing her sons, and she's, 
a wonderful manipulator that is, she's able to, to provide this encouragement just to continue to, to fight the good fight, as it were. Um, I mean, when I read this, I, I find that it's so far removed from my own experiences. That it's, it's hard for me to, to make sense of, of how someone could be so you know, kind of consumed. And, and so often all I can uh, think of is all of those you know, terrible tales that we had from earlier periods in our own history, as Catholics say, in, in, within uh, the colony and those days when there was that persecution and a sense of, of having to, to battle together and, and, and bind ourselves together. Um, none of it seems very, you know, in keeping it, and it's just so challenging to make sense of how do you reconcile this with the Christian faith? How do you reconcile it with, um, with Jesus? And then you get a parable, <laughs> like uh, uh, reading from Luke's gospel today. So this is coming right at the, the very end of, of his journey to Jerusalem. So he's nearing Jerusalem uh, and all of those expectations are there. Uh, you know, that he's about to bring in the kingdom here and now. You know, just like the Maccabees um, did manage to establish a Jewish kingdom for that brief period there in the, the mid-2nd century BC. So there were certainly groups of people that thought that yes, this is what Jesus is going to do. He's going to establish this kingdom. When we read this, it seems pretty clear that the, uh, the king is not talking about God the Father. The, the, the historical figure that is being drawn upon is, is most likely Herod the Great, who went away indeed to, to get his claim to be the, the proper king of, of Israel, ratified by the Roman authorities, and then he returned, and there were... Uh, we're told by like historical writers like Josephus that he there were delegate delegations that were sent to try and um, prevent his rising to that position. We know that he was a very violent and cruel tyrant, a little bit like Antiochus uh, Epiphanes. So there is certainly strong parallels of, of evil that are present here. So we shouldn't be uh, we shouldn't have God the Father in mind. Often when Jesus tells parables about the king, you know, we have that sense that it's about God, it's about the Father that is the, you know, the code that is being unleashed here. But it seems that Jesus is, is really undermining all of those expectations, all of those senses of the way that the world normally is. You know, here within Luke's Gospel, everything is, is always upside down. Everything is always to be, you know, we don't read it on the literal level. There's always this deeper sense of what Jesus is, is truly trying to, to bring about. And so we know that, that in his dying and, and rising, that it did bring about a new sense of the kingdom and allowed that all to, to come to fruition, but not in the way that anybody expected at the time. And so this parable is, is really in, in some ways also setting us up for that sense of, of the way that we're meant to understand these things, not in the way of violence, not in the way of hatred, not in the way of a king with an army that is able to put to death all of, the, all of his enemies. You know, none of that kind of, of happens. In fact, who is put to death but the protagonists, the, the, the center people, it's Jesus and it's the disciples who are put to death, not because they've gone about through armed rebellion, but because they have resisted that. So it's a parable that, you know, that does in, in many ways challenge the, the very core of, of, of our beliefs and understandings of, of how to, to make sense of, of all of these things. So it requires us to sit and to read it and to pray with it long and hard to, to continue just to, to try and make sense of how is this um, impacting upon us and, and how do we fit within our, our own expectations and sense of all of this. So it's, it's, you know, it's challenging, it's not easy, and there's no simple way to, to kind of wave the magic wand and say, yes, this is the, the simple uh, interpretive key that will unlock all of these parables. No, this parable is deeply challenging and remains so. And it, sometimes we just need to accept that scripture does require you know, much work to, to make any sense at all of it.